Okay. Um, I grew up in a pastor's home. I was the sixth of nine children, and I was the only girl. Um, so I have five older brothers who the biggest range in age from them is 15. So they're stair steps. The last three are one year apart, all born in June. Oh, wow. And so um, then I came along and then I have three younger brothers. And um, so my father was a pastor and our family looked good from the outside, but our our home on, home life on the inside was much different than what was portrayed on the outside. So when my I accepted Christ when I was five years old, and um, I came to to know Christ after a Sunday Easter service, and my father actually led me to the Lord. And then when I was around nine years old, my father began to sexually abuse me, and the abuse lasted until I was 18 years old. And I never told anyone for many, many different reasons. Um, but when you're abused by your father, who's supposed to be your protector, um, you, you just don't know who you can trust, so you don't trust anyone. And at the time when my abuse started, I just shut down emotionally. I wasn't angry, I wasn't bitter, I wasn't depressed, but I was just surviving. I wasn't joyful, I wasn't happy, I wasn't, I just was surviving emotionally because you have to, that's one of the survival mechanisms that God gives us to survive in the situation that we're living in because otherwise you couldn't sit down at a table with somebody that had just abused you and act like, everything's okay um so um that's a little bit of my story i want to read in malachi um when i when we started our ministry i'm sorry when we started our ministry one of the first times i spoke a pastor's daughter who had also been abused much the same way that I had been abused, came to me and she goes, how can you forgive God? How, because you know that God could have just struck the father dead, you know, all of these questions that we have in our mind, um, where was God? How could he allow this when you're trying to do, you know, I was, I was trying always to be the perfect child always do what's right and um and part of that was was actually used against me because you know we're children obey your parents but this is right so i just knew that i had to obey my parents i didn't have any choice and god would have to take care of the rest um so this pastor's daughter said how do you not um be angry with God. And um, in Malachi, in chapter 3, it, in starting at verse, verse 13, um, it says, and this is like Malachi, God's talking, and then he gives the response back. But it says, your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed and those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. And that's how many victims of abuse feel. They feel like, okay, where is the justice? Why doesn't God just step in? Um, and then it says in verse 16, it says, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. 
And when I read that verse, it says to me, when, when my mom passed away um, a few years ago, my brothers and I were sitting around the table and we were just talking to each other about things that had happened while we were growing up and, and things that we were angry about with what, how my dad treated my mother and different things. And, and when I think about this verse, it's, it's just like that. When people are gathered around the table and they're, they're just talking about what they don't understand and how they've been hurt and why didn't God step in, different things like that. And it's, it's just interesting because they are praying to God. They're talking among themselves and God hears them and listens to them. And then it says, so a book of remembrance was written before them for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. And so that's like, I don't have to remember all the garbage. God still has a book of remembrance. And it it lets me know that I'm, I have enough value for God to know and write a book of remembrance for me. And then it says, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So that tells me there is a day of reckoning coming, and God is going to um, make things right in his time. And then chapter 4 goes on to tell what those that day of judgment is going to look like. And to be honest with you, I don't, I don't, it doesn't give me happiness to think that God is going to judge my father because there's, or that he has. Um, my, my dad passed away about two years ago. And so he's already met with God. I don't know. I honestly do not know if my dad was ever really a honest believer because it, it you have to wonder if somebody can do the things he did and not be not have a conscience um, if he's if the Holy Spirit is within him. But um, that's between him and God, and and God has is definitely the final judge. So um, that we're the PowerPoint. They don't they don't have a PowerPoint reader, but um, I can do it without. So. so the the title of um, my session was things that are helpful and things that are hurtful to victims, and some of this comes from my own experience, but a lot of it is from a survey that we did to survivors and things that, that people have said to them that have been hurtful and things that have been helpful to them. And also because even as, I know a lot of um, people here have been touched by abuse, they're, they're survivors, um, but it also helps us when we're ministering to others and what to say. Not that we're walking on eggshells all the time because something that we say may be hurtful, but we want to be mindful in how we can relate to people in a way that's sensitive. Um, and I want to qualify some of these things because it's not all me 100% this way, but um, these are some things that, that I have, that have helped me and that I've heard. So the first thing that you should know is that it's very difficult for a victim or a survivor to share their abuse with someone because they don't know who to trust. And if they come and share with you, then they must think that you are trustworthy. And so don't violate that trust that they've put in you. Um, but don't think that you have to solve their problems either. Sometimes they just need a listening ear and say, oh, I, that maybe I don't understand everything, but I, 
I'm here for you. You know, you don't have to solve their problems. Um, you just need to be there for them and help them. You know, if they're asking for advice, help them to find it if they need help. Help them to find whatever resources they need and just say, okay, I'm here for you whenever you need to talk or we'll work this, you know, we'll work things through together. But genuinely care about them. Um, don't say that you care and then, you know, they can see through, um, through things if you're not really a genuine person. So things that are helpful. Um, the first thing that people said were, was helpful is people who validate that the abuse is real and has impacted my life. And some of the things that people say when they validate is that I, it's not your fault. That's the first thing that, that victims need to hear. It's not their fault. And so many times when a, when a victim comes forward, they, even counselors and church leaders, victim blame. Okay, what were you doing that caused this? Or did you, how did you respond? Was your response sinful? And so they, they put a lot more burden on the victim. They re-victimize the victim. We don't want to do that. Um, another thing is to tell them that they, that you believe them, that it's okay to feel the way that they feel. In other words, don't say, well, you shouldn't be so angry. You shouldn't, you shouldn't want to be vindictive. You shouldn't want revenge. You know, it's okay. Those, those are normal feelings and that's how that person is feeling. So it's okay to feel that way, but we'll work through them. Um, I'm sorry that you've been through for what you've been through. Um, so, you know, those are validating statements that you can say. Another thing is that the person that's a survivor doesn't want to be left alone. Um, so they want somebody that's there with them. And especially when they go to, um, if they're pressing charges against an abuser. The, the biggest thing um, that court advocates see is that they, there are many people that come to court in support of the offender and very seldom do people come to support a victim. Mm -hmm. And especially when there's a, it's a church, prominent church member that is the abuse, the Fender, the accused, the church people will come in droves to support the offender and they will often be, be very, um, very hurtful to the victim. They'll tell her that, you know, they'll, they're just, I don't know. So when you know, of, if you know of somebody that is bringing charges, you know, if you can, go with them to court, go with them um, and just to show that you're standing with them. Um, give a hug or hold me when I'm crying. Now I'm going to, to qualify that statement. Always ask, is it okay if I give you a hug? Would you like a hug? And that's because abuse survivors, sometimes they can be triggered by, by hugs, but and sometimes they want a hug at one time, but another time they just need some space. So, and we're all like, we're all like that. Mm -hmm. So it's just good to, to say, is it okay if I give you a hug? And that way you let them, that's another way of empowering them as well. Mm -hmm. That you're in charge of your own body. I'd like to give you a hug if it's gonna be helpful, but you're gonna empower them. And then listen to them. Um, caring, compassion, understanding, encouragement. Call to check in. Um, I know for me, I don't call on people. I mean, I don't call people if I need something. I, I just think, okay, I need to do this by myself. I don't want to bother anybody. So if you know somebody that may be having a hard time, call them up because they are not gonna, they may not be comfortable reaching out to you. 
So just call and say, hey, how are you doing? Is there anything that I can do for you? Would you like to go out shopping? Because sometimes it's just knowing that you have a friend that cares enough to check in with you and wants to know, wants to make sure you're doing okay. And I know, I still, even though I'm in my healing journey, that it's very difficult for me to reach out to somebody and say, hey, can we get together? I'm, I'm still working on that. Um, and then another thing that they need help with is setting boundaries. A lot of times they've, they've been abused so much that they don't, they don't think that they are allowed to say no. And they have to always do whatever anybody asks. And, and it's hard for them to set boundaries. So um, it's good to have a support person that says, hey, you know, you, you can say no. And that person is taking advantage of you. Yeah. And, and maybe even um, help them by saying, okay, I'll be the bad guy. You know, I will tell them that you can't do this. And our son, we have a son that um, struggles in this area and he would have friends that didn't have a license that would want him to drive them everywhere and he couldn't say no. So then he got rid of his car and then they say, well, you can drive my car. And then, <laughs> so he gave up his license. But it's like, it, he, he would call on us and say, tell them that I can't drive your car. You know, it's because he couldn't say no himself and he couldn't set those boundaries. So that's another thing that survivors or victims may need to help, may need help doing, and then help them to build a support system. Okay, what do I need in place? They may not know what they need in place, but you can help them talk through, um, okay, what do you need for a support system? Do you need a counselor? Do you need a life coach? Do you need someone that you can call if you're struggling with this? And you just kind of help them think through things and then get a support system in place for them. Um, the next thing that survivors said is they, that they need people who help them regain their self-worth. Victims and survivors' self-worth is below ground level. They often feel like they are less than worthless. They feel... Um, I heard one testimony of a young girl that was abused and she thought that she that when she walked in a room people could actually smell her shame she felt like that she was totally worth worth less than garbage because that's how she was treated was like garbage mm -hmm. and so things that you can say that help to help a person regain their self-worth and not just say them, mean them. I care about you. Mm -hmm. God loves you. And they may not feel like God loves them because where was God? You know, a lot of them are asking that question, where was God? So they may not believe that. But if you show God's love, if God's love is thrown, shown through you and how you interact with them, then they and they can see God's love through you. Um, you are beautiful. You can do this. You can, you have much to offer. So we want to empower the victim. We don't want to do everything for them, but we do want them to know that they can do this and, and help them. Okay, how, if they don't even know where to start, say, say yeah, I know you can get through this and I know we can do it together. So let's, let's get a game plan and say, this is what we need to do first and this is what we need to do next and get a game plan, but then let them, then as they succeed in doing whatever they need to do, you know, just celebrate that. Mm -hmm. Do you see what you did? Do you see how well you did that? Um, and then, Another thing that we need to do is help them to feel safe um, by not criticizing them, not judging them, and don't take advantage of them. Um, and and when, when I 
say don't judge, don't criticize. If, if they need areas, if they have areas that they need to work on that are pulling them down, there's ways to tell them, you know, you to make those survival skills that you used in the past, they worked well then. But let's work on trying to not use that by breaking down some of your walls. And, and then you work, walk with them. You know, when you sit there and say, well, you're just too, you're just too um, careful. You don't trust anyone. But help them to learn how to trust and help them, you know, walk them through some of those things. You don't just say, well, you're so critical of everybody here. You, yeah. you think everybody's out to get you. It's, you show them ways, better ways to interact because they've been criticized and they already feel really bad about themselves. Um, now these things are things that people have said that were help, hurtful. Sympathy for the sex, for sex offenders or abusers. Um, and so often, this is the case. I mean, when you share your story with somebody and they say, well, maybe what, were, was your abuser a victim of abuse? And, it, and then they minimize or um, excuse the behavior. Well, it wasn't that bad. You know, it, it could have been worse, that type of thing. Um, and the biggest one is that, and we get at every conference that we go to, well, was your father abused? Maybe that's why he abused you. And it, it doesn't really matter whether he was abused or not. Mm -hmm. um, I was abused, but I don't go and abuse other people. It's not an excuse for me mm -hmm. to go and abuse. And, and I'm sure that my dad had things in his past that, that were not good, but it's not an excuse and it's not. So those are sympathy and minimizing and excusing um, the offender is not helpful, it's hurtful. The head in the sand attitudes, um, your offender would never do such a thing. I, I don't believe that that can happen here. That's like in a church that, oh, nobody, that could never happen here. We can't talk about things like that. Um, shaming messages or Bible verses. And Bible verses can be triggering to some victims because just like um, a stick can be used to beat a dog or it can be used to play with a dog and bring pleasure, Bible verses can be used to hit, hit somebody over the head, beat them down, spiritual abuse them, um, then and that then it becomes a trigger. Um, so some of the things that they hear that are spiritual abuses, God will use this to make you a better person. Yes, God can use everything that we've been through, but that's not what the victim needs to hear. You need to forgive. And forgiveness is part of the healing process, but it is it is part of the healing process. Mm -hmm. That we don't need to put that burden on the victim before they're ready to um, accept it. Ask God to deal with your offender and giving Bible verses is aspirin. You know, just read some scripture and it's gonna be okay. Um, things, other things that are hurtful is um, when people say you should see a counselor or have you gotten counseling, and it's the, it's again it's the attitude in which it's say it's being said because there are there is a way that says you know maybe we can find a counselor that can help you get over this part that you're going through. But when it's said in a manner that you're so broken that you need a counselor because you couldn't have gone through what you've gone through and still be intact mentally. You know, it's, it's that, what it is is that looking down on a victim because they, it's, it's the attitude. So I'm not saying
saying you shouldn't tell somebody, let's, let's find a counselor that will help you through this if they need a counselor. But to assume that everybody that has been a victim of abuse needs a counselor, some of them God, God has blessed and they are coping quite well. Um, not that we all can't use help and somebody to stand by us, um, but in the, and that was my response because Dale would share my story and these people that would say this had never even met me. And so they're assuming that I'm suicidal or I must be, you know, ready to jump off a cliff or something, that I'm on the edge. So they say, well, has she gotten counseling? And it was like, it was their first response. And it's like, you don't even know me. You don't, you don't know where I am mentally or anything, so. Yeah. I mean, can I just interject too? This is one that I put in there too because it, it really bugged me. Because I took it as I was sharing a faith story and people would just say, it was like a way to deflect. Like we don't yeah. really want to talk about this right now, so just let her go get some counseling and let's not talk about it. It was kind of a deflection. And yeah. so it was, it was one of the things that was, yeah. that was yeah. bugging me. Yeah, it's like, yeah, let's let's put, put them over here so we don't have to deal with them. Um, forgive and forget. Put it behind you, leave it in the past. So that is often said to victims. You just need to get over this and you just need to get on with your life. And, and if you are over it like that, then, then um, there's something wrong with you. You know, and it, in these, the especially sexual abuse, it affects all aspects of your life, your spiritual life, your emotional and your physical. It's everything. And you can't just say, okay, forgive and forget, and it's all in the past. And that's another thing. Forgiveness, people think oftentimes that if you've forgiven, then you can't bring it up. But that's part of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. And I should be able to bring it up. Yeah. And not in a hurtful way, but it's like, so that I can help somebody else that says, I'm not the only one going through this. And it does affect people very deeply. Mm -hmm. And and you're not going to be able to, there's scars that will be with, with you for the rest of your life. And yes, you can cope and you can heal, and but there's still things that, that you deal with on a daily basis or maybe, you know, maybe not daily, but they come up. And then the victim blaming is very hurtful and it's and it's almost universal that when you go to some Christian counselors, they do the victim blaming. And also some church leaders do victim blaming. blaming. Um, some of the things that they say when they're victim blaming is what do you what did you do to make him or her do that? What were you wearing? And you should pray more. And especially in domestic violence cases um, the wife is often or the victim because the husband can be also a victim of domestic violence but it's more common that the wife is um there the victim comes and they are told well you just need to pray more and be more submissive you need to pray so they're putting the burden onto the victim that if you know if you were praying more or if you were more submissive then you wouldn't get beat um, so that's, that's the victim blaming and putting more um, burdens on them. Being ignored and turned away because people don't believe me, that's very hurtful. Mm -hmm. So believe people, um, unless you you know, have reason not to believe them, you believe what they tell you. And, and even then, you just ask God for discernment. Yeah. And, um, but more, more often than not, people are um, and you may not believe it because it sounds way out there, but some of that stuff really does happen and it's way out there. Yeah. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is what, what to say and what not to say to victims of sexual abuse. And this is an excerpt from the Holcomb's book, Rid of My Disgrace. 
And it says, hurtful reactions toward a victim may be intentional, blaming, victim blaming, or they may arise from ineffective attempts to show compassion by people who mean well, but are uninformed. Um, this is a list of things not to say because they shame, blame, or doubt the victim. Um, what to say is I know how you feel. I understand. You're lucky that blank didn't happen. It'll take some time, but you'll get over it. Why don't you tell me more details about what happened? Don't worry, it's all going to be all right. Try to be strong. Out of tragedies, good things happen. Time heals all wounds. Wounds. It was God's will. You need to forgive and move on. Calm down and try to relax. You should get on with your life. That's what not to say. That's what not to say. These are things to say. I'm sorry this happened to you. I believe you. Thank you for telling me. How can I help? I'm glad you're talking to me now. I'm glad you're safe now. Now, if they are safe, say, okay, we need to make a plan to get you into a safe place. Yeah. And then help them. Follow up. Don't just say, we need to make a plan. Right. And then don't, <laughs> don't help them do that. But um, if they are safe, then tell them that you're glad they're safe now. It wasn't your fault, and that is top on the list. It's not your fault. Your reaction is not an uncommon response. It's understandable that you feel this way. You are not going crazy. These are normal reactions following an assault. Things may not ever be the same again, but they can get better. It's okay to cry. And I can send these to, um, if you guys share your email address on that back thing and say you want those notes, I'll send you the notes so that you can get those things to say and not to say. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments that they'd like to say, to share of things that have been helpful or hurtful?
with his hand and take all the pain away. But even if he doesn't, are we still going to praise him? Are we, are we still going to believe in him and trust in him? And so a lot of times when we're feeling like, God, why don't you just take this person and snuff out their life? Because you know that he could. And, and you think, oh boy, I am, I just blew it because I'm not thinking Christian thoughts. And you read the Psalms and you say, okay, David had the same exact thoughts that I'm having. And it's okay. He's a man after God's own heart. So sometimes they, the victim, especially ones that grew up in the church and have been silenced, every time they said anything that they were feeling, they, they, they were shut down. Mm -hmm. They think, okay, I can't have feelings of anger. I cannot have feelings of remorse or regret. You know, unless I'm praising God, then my thoughts are sinful. No. Your thoughts aren't sinful, and your emotions and feelings were given to you by God. Yes. You were made in God's image. And, and I think as women, I mean, we're more emotional, right. but we've also been told that we need to not be emotional. Right. I mean, I, you know, don't cry. I grew up with all brothers, so I, I, did, not, I did not cry growing up. I learned very young, you don't cry. And I don't think that even when my niece got, was molested and I started my healing journey then, I would have told you I was healed before then because I wasn't, I, I wasn't depressed. I wasn't, you know, I was going along. And I would have told you I was healed. First of all, I wouldn't have told you I was abused. But if you were to find out, I would have said, I'm, I'm okay, I'm healed. But then when when I started unpacking all that after my niece was, met, was abused, then I started crying. Mm -hmm. God started resurrecting those emotions that had died when I was a little girl. And it's like, I cried and then, and then it's okay to cry. And um, I'm still, I haven't gotten angry at heart. <laughs> I still am not an angry person, but um, but God has resurrect. He is resurrecting those emotions, and we have to let abuse survivors know that they can they can have those emotions, and it's not wrong, and it's not sinful. It's what you do with those emotions. Right. You know, as long as you're not going and killing somebody, you know. It's okay to have those emotions and to feel what you feel. And so if they tell you, I really want to see him dead. I really want, you know, that's how they feel. So say, you know, just, yeah, that's probably normal to feel that way because you've been hurt deeply. And let them know that it's okay. It's, it's so, and they are they aren't, you don't have to walk on eggshells with them. I'm, I know that this is what to say and what not to say. And it's not to say, if you say the wrong thing, they're gonna crumble because they have already endured. They are strong individuals. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you need to let them know, you know, you are very strong. You know, you've endured a lot, a lot that other people wouldn't have been able to go through. And just work on that. And then, that's what I want to say is that, you know, they aren't going to break because you said something unintentionally that might be hurtful, but we just want to be more sensitive to how we can help them without, without hurting them more. Okay, let's take a quick break and then we'll be back and move this over. Is it, is it lunchtime? Yeah. No, it's break. 